Good to be with you again. We're going to continue our study on leading more spiritually aware lives. And today, specifically, we're going to talk about the victory over darkness. In Matthew 16, Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell won't be able to overcome it. That verse tells us two things. Jesus is in the business of building his church. I love that. I want to participate. I want to be a help. I don't ever want to be caught tearing down or diminishing the church of Jesus Christ. I want to add to its strength. But Jesus told us something else. There's opposition. If the opposition were negligible or would, could be easily swept aside, I don't believe Jesus would have bothered to tell us about it. If he told us there's going to be opposition, it's because there'll be a response necessary from you and me to be overcomers. Well, that's the topic of this lesson today, how you and I can lead victorious, triumphant lives in spite of the very real opposition that presents itself to God's purposes in our lives. You're not imagining it. There is an opponent. But thanks be to God, through Jesus, he's given us the victory. Enjoy the lesson. I want to share a couple of verses with you. They're not in your notes, but they'll put them on the screens, just in case you didn't bring your Bible. The first one comes from the book of 1 Peter. It's in your New Testament. It's 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. This is Peter, the fisherman that Jesus recruited. He said to Peter as a young man, a teenager, if you'll follow me, I'll make you a fisher of men. And Peter followed Jesus. And we have two letters in the New Testament that he wrote near the end of his life. A very different man than the one we meet on the shores of Galilee. He has given his strength, the strength of his life, to honoring Jesus. And he writes these letters to us. They're filled with wisdom. But in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11, he said, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world. Let's, let's pause there just a moment. It's, there's a, there's a, a prompting in this. He's urging us towards something. But he gives us a, a perspective on how to see the world. He said, you're aliens and strangers here. He's not calling us weird. He's saying to, to think of the, the current world system as a temporary residence. There's two words used in the New Testament for the world. One has to do with the, the physical sphere that's hurtling through space, this ball of matter that we call planet Earth. The other word has to do with the systems, the world order, the present order of this world. And that's what Peter's talking about here. He says, you're aliens and strangers in this present world order. You, you have in your mind a different calling, a different set of priorities, a different set of values. You're striving for something different. We're aliens here, strangers here. I've had the privilege, I don't travel a lot, but over the course of my life, I've had the privilege of traveling to, to a lot of different places in the world, Africa and the Middle East and Asia. And I love to go and see and meet the people and experience the foods and see all those places, but I, there, there's no place like home. I've never visited any place and thought, oh, I'm going to stay here. You know, there's something about sweet tea and sausage gravy and biscuits I mean, yeah, amen, brother. <laughs> when they're feeding you something that you're quite certain isn't food, sweet tea and a ham and biscuit sounds like something from heaven itself, I promise you. And Peter's kind of using, he said, we're aliens here. We don't get too comfortable. There should be something different about what we're aspiring to and longing for. And I know we're in church and the right answer is Jesus, but truthfully, fundamentally in our hearts, but he goes on beyond that. He said, you're aliens and strangers in the world. I urge you to abstain from sinful desires. Now he's stopped talking to you. He's meddling. He's acknowledging. He's writing to Christians. And he said, Christians struggle with sinful desires. If we didn't struggle with them, he wouldn't urge us to abstain from them. If it was something we knew nothing about, he wouldn't have to say abstain from it. I urge you to abstain from sinful desires. Look at the next phrase, which war against your soul. Those are very intense words. Warfare in my soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Peter's saying there is a war in your emotions. I feel inclined to something that has very little to do with God. And it's not a passing feeling, it's a strong thing in me. I think, I have thoughts that'll take me in a very ungodly direction. I want, I have wants and desires that don't reflect godliness at all. And Peter says, I urge you to abstain from those things. 
because it's a war in you. Can we be honest enough to say that even though we come to church and we have Bibles and we volunteer our time and give our money, that there's still a war in our feelings? See, if we don't acknowledge, if we don't recognize that there's a, there's a spiritual influence here, if we're nothing more than a, a mass of protoplasm that drifted up out of the primordial ooze and has evolved into our current state, if there really is no higher calling to our lives, then, then there's no war in us. You just do whatever you feel like. But if we are created by God in the image of Almighty God, and if there is within us an awareness of, of good and evil, then there is a conflict within us. There are forces at work within us. And being a Christ follower, reciting a sinner's prayer, and being dunked in a baptistry and sitting in a church seat doesn't remove you from that arena of conflict. We need a power greater than our self-will. We need a power greater than deceiving the people we worship with. We need a power greater than being able to deafen ourselves at church when the pastor is talking about something we don't want to listen to. We need a power to help us honor the Lord. You see, a spiritually healthy life isn't about jumping through hoops to please God. It's about living in such a way that God's greatest blessings can fill our lives. I want to conduct myself in such a way that the blessings of God can fill my life. And candidly, that often feels like a battle in me. Being a pastor doesn't remove me from that arena. You cut me off in traffic, praise the Lord, may not be the first thing that leaps to my mind. <laughs> I hit my thumb with a hammer, hallelujah. <laughs> may not be what comes up on the screen in me. It's why I have to monitor what I watch and what I listen to. It's important. There's a war in us. Let me give you one other passage. It's in the book of Galatians. It's not in your notes either, but they'll share it with us on the screens. Galatians chapter 5. This time it's not Peter. It's the apostle Paul. And he's using a very similar language. Peter was talking about our sinful desires, and Paul talks about the acts of our sinful nature. Paul makes it a little more personal. He says, we have a nature towards ungodliness. He's writing towards Christians too. So the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. And then he gives us a whole long list. Now the good news, everything on that list probably isn't a part of your war. Hallelujah. If everything on that list is a war within you, bless you. But the other end of that reality is something on that list is a part of the war within you. Something on that list is at war within you. We'd like to invite you to join us for one of our weekend worship services here at World Outreach Church. You'll find lots of friendly people, engaging worship, and transformational encounters in exploring the Word of God together. There's something here for the whole family. You can choose from four service times, Saturdays at 5 and 7 p.m., Sundays at 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. Located right off of I-24, we're easy to find. You can visit our website to find our location. So join us. We'd love to see you here at World Outreach. Now, I've still got a couple of minutes left, and I want to use them to do very briefly a case study with you. To see if we can give some application to this idea of spiritual forces changing the outcomes of our lives, enabling us to stand in places we could never stand with our own physical strength. And I've taken the story from a place that we just completed in our daily Bible reading a couple days ago. It's in the book of 2 Kings. It's, it's, it's focused when Elisha is the prophet in Israel. Now, you remember with me that after King Solomon, there's a civil war, and the nation of Israel is divided into two kingdoms. The southern kingdom is Judah, and the capital of Judah is Jerusalem. The northern kingdom retains the name of Israel, and the capital now of Israel is Samaria. Go to the head of the class. Bright folks at 1030. Well, Samaria has been besieged, encircled by a foreign army. And when a city is besieged, they wouldn't allow anyone into the city or anyone out of the city, so there was no longer any food supply. It was a means of starving a population into submission. And the siege has in in, been in place long enough that there is a famine in the city of Samaria. In fact, it has grown so horrible that the people have resorted to cannibalism. It, it's almost beyond imagination. And it's reported in the Scripture. 
It says that two families made an agreement to offer their children. And one, one parent complied, and when it was the other family's turn, they hid their child, and the mothers come to the king to complain. It's beyond imagination. And the king tears his clothing, and he said, no one could, it's beyond me. What can I do? There is no hope. And Elisha, the prophet, says, tomorrow there'll be bread for everybody. It's impossible. There is no way. There, there's no military solution. If they'd had a military solution, they would have implemented it long ago. There's no economic solution. There's no negotiation. There's nothing. Elisha says, tomorrow there's bread. Now, that's the part of the, the story I put in your notes. Uh, I think you probably know the story or a bit of it. It's about these four leprous men. There were four men with leprosy, the entrance to the city gate. Leprosy was an incurable skin disease. You weren't allowed to mingle with the general population. These four men are in a worse condition than the people in the city. They're so bad. They're not even allowed in the city. And in the city, they're practicing cannibalism. So these guys are, they're be, wherever you tie a knot in the end of your rope, they're below the knot. It says these four men, they said to each other, why well, stay here until we die? They said, if we just keep doing what we've always done, we know we're going to die. So if we say we'll go into the city, the famine is there and we'll die. If we stay here, we'll die. So let's go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, then we die. These guys are not optimists. <laughs> they say, look, if we sit here, we're going to die. If we go in there, we'll die. If we go over there, they're probably going to kill us. But if they do, they'll kill us more quickly than this miserable death we're facing right now. So let's go. I mean, this is not a happy, clappy group of people. And in verse 5, it says, at dusk, about dark, they got up and they went to the camp of the Arameans. And when they reached the edge of the camp, not a man was there. For the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army. So they said to one another, look, the king of Israel has hired foreign armies to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dark and abandoned their tents and their horses and their donkeys, and they left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. There was no army. It just says God caused them to hear one. And the men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp. Now, they didn't hear the army. They were expecting to find it populated with Arameans. And they reached the edge of the camp. And they entered one of the tents, and they ate, and they drank, and they carried away silver and gold and clothes, and they went off and hid them. And they returned, and they entered another tent, and they took some things from it, and they hid them also. Our heroes in this story are not really great folks. <laughs> All their friends and families are starving to death. And they find a buffet table, and they eat until they have gorged themselves. And then they decide to plunder the tent the gold and the silver and the clothing, and they go bury it. They come back and find another banquet table and they start in again. So their bellies are distended with food. Their hands are covered with blisters from burying the bounty. And then they say, uh, maybe we should tell the others. <laughs> you think, think that would be the good thing to do. And they do, and the whole city is delivered from the siege. It's a remarkable story with the most improbable characters. There's really no one heroic in appearance or heroic in their story. It's, it's broken people that God is using for some remarkable things. And in it, I, I think there's some hope for me, and I hope for you as well. It starts the story of great need. Tremendous need, un, un, unimaginable need, both within the city and in the lives of these four men. Now, I tell you that because it's a God story. It's a miracle story, but it emerges from great need. See, in my life, I think if I'm in a place where I have great needs, that God is far from me. That somehow I've failed him or he's abandoned me or that there's some sort of injustice or punishment. Folks, places of great need are places where we can be very close to the Lord. And we have to make a choice to believe God that he will deliver us or just to surrender to our current situation. Now, you'll have to make that choice. Whether you're going to believe God and trust him or you're just going to surrender to your circumstances. There's a war inside of you. There's a war in your thoughts. There's a war in your feelings. There's a war in your will. 
I would invite you to say, I believe God can and would deliver me. The why me question always pops up inside of Alan. And I, I realized it's the wrong question. I have to get up and begin to exert whatever faith I have, however small it may be. I may not have the power to turn around the problem. I may not have the solution. I may not have the resources. But I can get up and begin to thank God that he does. I can do that. That's a choice on the inside. I may not feel like it. I may not want to. But I can choose to do it. Folks, I come to work when I don't feel like it. I come to work when I don't want to. I come to work when I can find all kinds of reasons why I shouldn't. Don't you? Have you seen those commercials on TV where the parent comes in and announces to their child they're taking a day off? It's kind of funny. We all know better. You don't get that. It's not about what you feel or you think or you want. You make a choice. Choose to thank God. Now, there is a challenge, I think, in any group of Christians, there's always some of us who go, so, you know, I don't really have any needs, Pastor. I got it pretty much together. God bless you. We're just grateful to hang around with you. <laughs> but I would give you one cautionary note. Because sometimes the, the religious systems we design reward, seem to reward those of us who have no needs. The book of Revelation is written to seven churches. It's a revelation God gave to John. Jesus came to his friend John with a revelation. It was a message that he wanted delivered to seven churches. So there were seven churches so close to the heart of God that he wanted to give them a private message from Jesus. So it's not written to reprobates or to the immoral or to the pagans. It's written to God's chosen people. And one of those churches is the church at Laodicea. And I, I put a little passage in your notes. It's Revelation 3. Jesus said, you say I am rich, and I have acquired wealth, and I don't need a thing. That's the self-analysis of these believers. I'm rich, I have acquired much, and I truthfully have no needs. And then Jesus gives them a diagnosis. He said, you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. That's a very startling contrast. Again, this is written to, to believers now. Jesus said, you say, I have no needs. And I say, you don't even realize you're blind and naked. Now, I want to ask you a question. How messed up would you have to be to be standing in public naked and not know? You have to have, be in a pretty seriously altered condition, don't you? I mean, that's more than too much communion. <laughs> Fair enough. To stand in a public, blind and naked and say, I really have no needs. So there, there's, a, there's a little cautionary light in my head when I arrive in a place and I think, you know, I pretty much got it together. I found it to be a more helpful prayer in my life to say to the Lord, Lord, help me to see myself as you see me. Help me to see myself as you see me. Not how the people at church see me. Not how my neighbors see me. Because people tend to look at your life and think it's easy for you. You know, if you've got kids and your kids are reasonably well behaved, the, the parents who have kids that need cages, they think it's easier for you. They do. And those of you that manage to put together kind of a godly presentation, people look at you and think, you're wired differently than me. And it's helpful for me to say, Lord, help me to see myself as you see me. I, and, and when there's, a, when there's a, a weakness or a need, or it's not a point of failure, it's a point of opportunity. The, the second piece of that story is they were dependent on God's timing. It's the most problematic part of the story. Why didn't God intervene before the horrific things were happening in the city? I don't know. I honestly, I don't know. I could give you an opinion, but I don't know. I can tell you what I have discovered through my life is the deliverance comes when I'm capable of receiving it. It comes when I'm capable of receiving it. Because even if it's present, until I'm capable of receiving it, I'll miss it. Have you ever tried to help a little child? You know, they'd be playing a game, not doing a task. They'd be playing a game, trying to put shaped figures in the right slot. 
And they don't yet have the dexterity to do that very well. And they're, they're trying to do it. And they're getting frustrated and they're slamming them around and they're getting, losing their interest because it's not working right. And you decide to intervene and say, I'll help. No, put this one here. About nine times out of 10, ten, what will they say? Oh. And if you insist, me do it. Get your hands out. You don't know how to play my game. And I do that with the Lord. I'm not always the most cooperative because there's a battle in my soul. And I'm not always willing to say to the Lord, which way do you want me to go? Because I wrongly imagine that God's way is loathsome, that it'll diminish me, take something away from me. Me do it. God's timing. The third piece is there always seems to be more discouraging voices than I would like there to be. There's enough people to say you can't or you shouldn't or why would you do that or you don't want to be a fanatic or, you don't, no, don't go too far. Discouraging voices are never in short supply. I read you those verses from 2 Kings, the verses immediately preceding them. I put back in your notes, 2 Kings 7, 1 and 2. Elisha, the prophet says, hear the word of the Lord. This is what God says. This time tomorrow there'll be food for everybody. And the officer on whom the arm of the king was leaning said to the man, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of heaven, this couldn't happen. The one person you would expect to have been a voice of affirmation, the, kid, the, the officer in charge of defending this city, that they are starving to death because he's not capable of doing his job, and rather than embrace the announcement from God, he has a discouraging response. And I have no doubt that if you're standing in a place of great need, that there is an ample number of discouraging voices around you. I'll tell you what I've discovered. Even if there aren't any externally, there are plenty internally. Even people that don't intend to be discouraging will say things, and you will be able to interpret them, interpolate them into discouraging messages. Isn't that true? And we'll have to decide what we're going to put our faith in. God, in this case, there was provided help from some rather unlikely candidates. He recruited four leprous men, the least qualified, the most unlikely. They were unseemly. You wouldn't even want to look at them. They were an uglier picture than the people inside the city. Four gaunt, broken men marching forward, but marching's an overstatement. They stumbled and fell and helped one another up and staggered. They had no hope of a good outcome. They had no hope of a victory. They were just going for a quicker death than the one they were dying. See, some of you have imagined that following God's this pretty thing, like a parade, like close order drill. We're in our finest uniforms and everything is neatly pressed. And we stop at the right time and we turn at the right point. I thought that. I thought if I ever gave my heart fully to the Lord, life would just get easy. Because I'd been a hypocrite for so long. I thought if I ever got all in with God, it would just get easy. I thought when I, I woke up in the morning, I would wake up with fresh breath. <laughs> and every hair would be in place. And when, I, when the, 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 the sun broke the horizon and the birds began to sing, they would awaken me from sleep. And I would leap from the sheets, say, God, I'm so glad to meet the day. What holy thing might I do for you this morning? I thought that. But I can tell you at this point in my journey, when I wake up in the morning, I need a toothbrush. <laughs> and I need a hairbrush. And a lot of days I said, God, you know, a couple more hours of sleep would have been really good. And I don't know what you have for me today, but if you'll give me the strength, I'll walk towards it. Folks, I have discovered being a Christ follower is not about some pristine, neat, orderly thing. God took four gaunt, leprous, broken men, and in their simple act of faith and in steps forward, he caused an outcome. What did he say in Habakkuk? He'd make our feet like the feet of a deer, that you stand in a place nobody would think you could stand. There's a power at work on your behalf, a force at work on your behalf. Don't minimize it. Don't ignore it. Don't do anything to diminish it. Open your life as fully as you can to cooperate with the Lord. Don't allow anything that would diminish the presence of God in your life to stay in your life. Not anger, not resentment, not unforgiveness, not bitterness. Don't tolerate it. There's a war in us. 
in our thoughts, in our emotions, in our minds, between moral and immoral, between anger and peace, between jealousy, all kinds of things, determined to cooperate with the Lord. It's not easy, but the outcomes are remarkable. God is able. Our God is a delivering God. We'd like to invite you to join us for one of our weekend worship services here at World Outreach Church. You'll find lots of friendly people, engaging worship, and transformational encounters in exploring the Word of God together. There's something here for the whole family. You can choose from four service times, Saturdays at 5 and 7 p.m., Sundays at 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. Located right off of I-24, we're easy to find. You can visit our website to find our location. So join us. We'd love to see you here at World Outreach. You know, it's a truth that there's a spiritual conflict in the world around us. But an equal truth, and one that's even more significant, is the real conflict is within us. Being Christ followers doesn't eliminate us from that tug of war between good and evil, between our carnal self and the invitations of the Spirit of God. My simple word of encouragement today is do your best to say yes to the Lord. Cooperate with the Spirit of God. The battle within you doesn't mean you're a failure. It doesn't mean that you're unusually wicked. It means you're human. But the Spirit of God will help us. I want to pray for you before we go. Father, I thank you for every person. I pray they will recognize your invitations and say yes to godliness and no to ungodliness. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Join us every week for another exciting message from Pastor Alan Jackson. And until then, visit us online at intendministries.org and discover remarkable information and resources to help take your Christian life to the next level. And when you visit online, consider joining our effort to continue sending this powerful and challenging message around the globe. We want to share this program worldwide, but we can only do it with your help. So consider partnering with us today. And if you're visiting the Nashville area, we'd love to see you at World Outreach Church in Murfreesboro. We're easy to find, so look us up when you're traveling through. And don't forget to connect with Pastor Jackson every day through social media. Thanks so much for joining us and being a part of this ministry. We'll see you again next time for another encounter with Pastor Alan Jackson.